keeping with tradition uh, to have a breakfast speaker on Tuesday mornings. We have a wonderful presenter this morning and someone who needs no introduction. And so we'll get him right up here to the podium. But if you would please welcome David Sheffer. Thank you. By the way, uh, Jim, there we go. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone. I'm going to make this uh, very quick this morning because uh, I'm going to keep this to no more than, oh, 20, 25 minutes and then maybe five or 10 minutes for questions and then we, we break. Um, I am, uh, one of my hats is as uh, the UN Secretary General Special Expert on UN Assistance to the Khmer Rouge Trials, and I've been in that position since January of 2012. Now there are many people in the room who have great uh, experience and exposure to the court. Uh, obviously, uh, Nick Kumjan, the, the prosecutor who came on board um, within the last year is, is here with us. Andrew Cayley is with us, who had so many years experience prior to him. Hans Carell, who was uh, head of the UN negotiating team uh, in the uh, uh, late 1990s and early 2000s. And even Kip Hale, who worked in the prosecutor's office with Andrew Cayley. So all of the wisdom is out there, and I'll just do the best I can here. Um, what I wanted to do was just quickly give you an update on where we are with the Extraordinary Chambers. My responsibilities are uh, basically uh, sort of threefold in this job. One is uh, obviously keeping up with the substance of the court at all times uh, in terms of the motion practice and the judgments, et cetera, um, and working with UN lawyers in, in uh, overseeing the UN component of this court. This is a, a, a joint venture between the United Nations and the uh, Royal Government of Cambodia. We have a treaty relationship with Cambodia for this court, um, but it is a Cambodian court, um, and it is internationalized with staff, uh, judges, prosecutors, administrators, etc., from the United Nations. But um, there's also a very heavy Cambodian component to the court to the extent that the judges are in the majority, uh, but there are two co-prosecutors, one international, one Cambodian. There are two co-investigating judges, one international, one Cambodian. Um, so it's a, it's a unique being. All of you have been reading about it. It's been debated for years, but today we are simply going to update ourselves about it, okay? Um, and so, let's start. Just to remind you, the cases, um, we're finished with case number one, Doik, he was convicted and is serving life imprisonment. I visited him in Kandal Prison, uh, south of uh, Phnom Penh, uh, on, on several occasions now, um, and uh, he's gonna be fine. He's still relatively young. I suspect he'll, he'll be there for quite some time in his life. Um, case number two, phase one, uh, Kusum Pan Nguyen Chia, uh, has just arrived at, uh, at the conviction on August 7th, uh, life imprisonment and on appeal. Um, phase one, uh, I, I'm not gonna go through everything Nick went through, so just take that on board uh, and I'm not gonna repeat all of that. I think the important thing is to note, Nick, Nick didn't quite mention this yesterday, the reparations that came out of phase one of case two are quite unique, uh, path-breaking, interesting to read, academically fascinating to study, um, but these are reparations which are not cash payments to victims for any, uh, uh, on any basis whatsoever. They're basically projects like setting up memorials, uh, doing uh, mental rehabilitation. There's a tremendous amount of uh, 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 trauma that still pervades in the Cambodian population, and there are almost no mental health facilities in Cambodia. So there's a lot of focus on that as well. There's also uh, uh, distributing the, the verdict itself in writing uh, and in Khmer to all, you know, as many villages as possible throughout the country, which is a very effective way of getting the decision out there. That has been supported by uh, uh, the German Foreign Ministry and by the Swiss Development Agency in a very large uh, uh, degree. So uh, that took a lot of work uh, from October through March uh, of the last year. Uh, I got quite involved with that, a uh, tremendous amount of lobbying with governments, et cetera, to get those voluntary contributions in. 
This is where the trial chamber um, in October said, you know, by October, you have to tell us exactly what the projects are, and we will approve those projects so that they are part of the actual judgment of, uh, that, that we deliver. But they will only be activated if you, put, if you get enough money in the bank by March 31st to actually cover those reparations. So the race was to get enough money collected by March 31st, and we achieved our objectives. Um, so it was a, a real sort of success story on the issue of reparations. And that is now ginning up for phase two. The NGOs have learned their lesson not to leave it to the last moment. And there's already a tremendous amount of planning for reparations that would flow out of phase two if, of course, there's a guilty verdict out of phase two. If, it's, if there's no guilty verdict, no reparations. Um, and then, of course, we're in phase two now of case number two. And this is, uh, I think Nick explained phase two yesterday to you in terms of a, a complex uh, range of crimes that are now uh, before us for trial. Case number three and case number four are under active investigation, um, a very active investigation. Um, there's a lot of kind of updating on that. I'll just say that it's almost all sensitive right now. Uh, I think you just have to trust some of us that uh, there's an enormous amount going on. It cannot be disclosed publicly, um, but it's happening, and you'll hear about it when you hear about it. Uh, the, the NGOs in particular, and I hear this every time I'm there, I'm there once a month, um, always are grading at this because they want transparency. They want to know what's going on. And the problem is it's an investigation. <laughs> you can't be that transparent at this stage. Um, but I think ultimately you're going to see a lot of stuff come out. You're going to see uh, the possibility of summons um, and, and of arrest warrants, uh, so stay tuned. Um, and then there will be no further cases under investigation, and that is, uh, that's a long story, um, but uh, we can get into it if you wish to. This will be the close of the court's work with uh, case number four. Public attendance is impressive. Um, for the, uh, these numbers far exceed the totality of all public who sat, who, are, who have sat in all of the proceedings of all the other war crimes tribunals, as well as Nuremberg and Tokyo. This exceeds it. Uh, you can total up all the other numbers. This exceeds it. Um, for case number one, Doik, uh, 36,493. For case number two, all hearings since January 2011, 113,830, uh, uh, mostly Cambodians, have sat in the audience. The, uh, the court houses about 320, Nick, something like that, 320 people, something around that, num that number. Yeah. Um, and um, so you have a total as of 30 June 2014 of 150,000 uh, plus uh, Cambodians who have witnessed uh, these proceedings. And it's fascinating to watch them. It really is. Uh, uh, I, I do it all the time. Uh, it's a range from, uh, you know, high school students in their uniforms to elderly people to uh, Buddhist monks, uh, uh, you name it, they're all there. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, and the, 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 the Cham Muslim come in in large numbers uh, into the courtroom, uh, and they're coming up now to see the trial on the genocide charges. The outreach program um, uh, numbers impressively, 92, 93,000. This is where the court's not in session, but they're still bringing Cambodians in for lectures into the courtroom. So that's a, that's a huge number going on, sort of a classroom experience. And then 58 lectures have been held by the court around the country, and then that has uh, embraced about 86,000 uh, Cambodians in that process. Now, there are major issues that confront us in the court. None of this is crisis or anything. This, these are just issues that are popping up. Um, there will be, there's an interesting uh, motion for disqualification that has been filed recently by defense counsel for some of the trial chamber judges in phase two of case two. The motion basically being if you sat on phase one, how can you possibly be sitting on phase two? Lots of arguments around that. So. The court's going to have to deal with that motion for disqualification. By the way, on the trial chamber, Judge Sylvia Cartwright of New Zealand recently retired uh, from that duty. She went on to, now she's going to be involved in Sri Lanka investigations. 
Um, and she has been replaced by Judge Claudia Fenz of Austria, who was the, was the reserve judge for all of these years. And uh, we're very close to announcing, it's in the Secretary General's office, who will replace Claudia Fenz as the reserve judge. But that has not been officially signed off on yet by the Secretary General, but it's been recommended by the legal counsel. Um, there, there is a, um, uh, in, in the judgment on phase one on August 7th, there was a split decision between the national judges and the international judges on the merit of insisting that certain senior Cambodian officials appear as witnesses, uh, not as defendants, but as witnesses in phase one. They had refused to appear in the courtroom. Um, but in the end, that, that difference between them did not override reaching judgment on guilt or innocence with respect to uh, the two defendants. But nonetheless, academically, it's a very interesting uh, split decision to, to look at. Um, the, and, and obviously, it'll be something that the defense counsel will bring up on appeal you know, in phase one. So it'll go to the Supreme Court chamber for further consideration. Um, the duration of the appeals process in case two, phase one, we're now into the appeal on phase one. Um, it's usually an 18-month process. Um, and I think one of the great challenges, which I was exploring a couple of weeks ago in Phnom Penh, was whether once the motion practice is finished on appeal, which is usually about six to seven months long, is there any way for the judges to reach their decision, not in a typical 12-month period, but can we perhaps be looking at nine or eight months? Is that possible if you get enough staff, et cetera? Um, and the reason is the health of the defendants. We'd like to get an appeals you know, judgment before uh, the possibility of 83 or 88-year-old 80, men uh, passing away. Um, the um, outcome of the, co oh, the co prosecutor's motion to amend the internal rules, I believe you might have mentioned this yesterday, Nick, no? Um, Nick, uh, very imaginatively, uh, along with his Cambodian colleague, uh, put forward a motion in April, I think, um, uh, or March, um, to, for consideration by the plenary of the court to amend the internal rules so as to allow a far easier reduction in the number of crime sites to be investigated uh, without changing the charges or anything. But of course, in the original um, uh, uh, app, uh, submission on this point, there, there are a number of charges with a number of crime sites associated with those uh, charges. And this would uh, uh, give the prosecutor the ability to say, well, look, we can reduce a certain number of crime sites and then get the approval of the judges as to that proposal uh, without sort of violating civil law procedures with respect to, to that to type of idea. Um, I won't go into it in detail, but it's a very, very interesting motion. And I think the judges are having a very interesting time discussing it. And uh, we will see the outcome of that very shortly, I believe. Um, and then finally, the health of uh, these two defendants, of course, for the entire prosecution of case two. They do have a clean bill of health. They're healthy. Uh, we've had doctors check them out. So, you know, they're, they're going to be with us um, to the extent that we know. Um, now, uh, potential summons to appear in cases three and four, I think I've already hinted at this. Um, obviously, once these summons are issued, the question is uh, these particular suspects actually responding to it, uh, the judicial police actually following through on the, uh, the agreement, uh, and the law states that it's, it is the judicial police that enforce these, uh, these points, uh, these summons, and so we have to see all of that unfold. Uh, so let's hope that happens. Um, and then, of course, the big one is the potential disagreements between the co-investigating judges and or the co-prosecutors in case three and or case four. And notice all those and ors. Um, we do have a procedure in the constitutional documents of the court to deal with these disagreements. Uh, so the procedure is set. Um, and the question is, will there be such disagreements? Um, long story, uh, I think it's more complicated than anyone assumes, namely complicated in the sense that you may see some, some disagreements, but you also may not see some disagreements. Don't assume that everything is going to be disagreed. 
um, you know, hang on. Uh, there's a lot of work being done behind, uh, you know, within the court and the chambers on this issue. Uh, and uh, don't think that case three and case four are so synonymous that their thinking about both cases is exactly identical. There are differences between these cases. There are differences between the suspects. And uh, don't assume that everything is going to be disagreed. And then finally, secondments for the Office of the Prosecutor and the Office of the Co-Investigating Judges. Nick could speak to a much greater length about this, but I have since uh, February or March, we've been trying to reach out. Uh, the American Bar Association, Kip Hale, was just fantastic on this, getting the word out to American lawyers. You know, if you're interested in uh, being seconded to the court to assist the judges or the prosecutors, um, uh, you know, uh, let us know. Now, seconded means someone's got to cover all of your expenses, salary, benefits. It's not going to be the court. It's not the UN. We're not paying. Someone else pays. So that's the big caveat, okay? Your employer says, go off and be a good guy for six months and I'll cover you. Um, so, you know, that narrows the field <laughs> considerably. This secondment means secondment, you know, period. I had to put that in bold in the note, you know. Um, but guess what, I just got to tell you this anecdote. What is the one country in the world that just flooded us with applications? Australia. We, we worked through the, the Australian mission in New York and then the Australian Law Society, I think it's called, uh, which is comparable to the ABA. And um, they put this notice out. And unfortunately, it was my email address they put in for everyone to respond to. And I literally got hundreds of emails from Australia. And I finally said, don't they want to work? Isn't there any work in Australia? What is this? You know? But just hundreds of lawyers in Australia wanted to work for the court. And uh, well, anyway, so we got back to them and, you know, and re reminded them, you do understand what secondment means, you know. But anyway, uh, that is in process. And, and I think we've had some minor achievements on that front uh, to get people, including for Judge Hardman uh, uh, in the investigating office. OK, projected timelines. Um, this is the big question everyone asks. Of course, the funders always ask this question. I just want to show it to you. You'll see that um, there, are, there are several years ahead of us uh, with this court, which is the funding challenge, of course. Um, uh, but uh, this is the most realistic assessment of uh, getting uh, this work accomplished. And of course, on cases three and four, if we do get to a closing order that is an indictment that moves towards trial on either uh, or both three and four, then you're really talking about a court that is going to stretch uh, to 2020 or 2021 uh, in order to deal with those uh, cases. But of course, also, when you look at the budget, the budget it, it comes down because you're getting rid of the co-investigating judges, you're getting rid of the pretrial chamber, you're getting rid of, rid of a lot of infrastructure once you get through the investigative stage of the court's work. So you're, you can start to look at a, a budget line that comes down a bit, uh, but you know it's still going to be up there to get through phase two of case two and then deal with whatever is there for case three and four. New developments. Um, since last sum, from last summer until April, uh, we worked very hard in New York to break the mold. And the UN General Assembly finally approved uh, in April uh, what we call commitment authority, but, but which is also sort of known as subvention. The Special Court for Sierra Leone, I think, uses the word subvention in terms of, of what it achieved with the General Assembly. Ours is a little bit different. It's called commitment authority. Um, we got it for $15.5 million, which means that uh, if we're short on the budget, we can draw from that $15.5 million to cover the costs of the court in, any, in, in this particular fiscal year at the UN. This is just a one-year deal. It has to be renewed. It does, it's not some perpetual authority. So we are gearing up now to return in November to get a renewal of our commitment authority. But here's the twist. As our good friends in the Fifth Committee said to us, and Hans, you know, you, you know the Fifth Committee, how, how awful they can be, frankly. 
they said, well, yes, we're going to give you uh, 15.5 million, but don't use it. In other words, just we want you to raise everything voluntarily. Uh, this is sort of your backup guarantee, but of course, we don't want you to draw your guarantee. Because if we draw the 15.5, the UN has to sacrifice that money somewhere else. It's not new money. Some other program has to get cut. And so we're still under enormous pressure to raise money voluntarily, but we have sort of this security blanket which gives us a foundation to work with and also the support of the member states of the UN for what we're doing. And it's extremely helpful um, uh, to have that commitment authority backing us up because it actually incentivizes countries uh, to fund us. It's a confidence building uh, measure. I'm sorry? Oh, oh yes, and the other big issue, Nick is absolutely right, my God, the, the major reason we've got the commitment authority is that um, it allows us at the beginning of the year to, to sign off one-year contracts on staff because we know we can back it up with payment if necessary. If you don't have the money in the bank, you can't sign those one-year contracts, and that was a huge problem in 2012 uh, for the court when I came on board was being able to sign those one-year contracts. Now we can sign one-year contracts. That stabilizes the staff. We have started this year quarterly completion plans, um, which is a new deal. Uh, it used to be that we would tell the funders every two years what, what's happening with this court, what's our timeline, you know, what, what's the projection. Now we do it every quarter. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is it right here. It's this kind of small plan. We do this every quarter. It, it is a public document. It goes up on the ECCC website. Um, and it's a very detailed plan. And the point is, it's not prepared by the administrators of the court. It's prepared by the judges and the prosecutors who inform us what do they see as the timelines of their work. And then, of course, it's organized by administrators. But the point is, the substance, the, the gut of this report, the facts of this report come from the real people. I mean, the judges and the prosecutors are the ones who are, are putting this together. Uh, in terms of its empirical uh, 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 value. Uh, and, and this is a tremendous benefit to the donors. They love this. You know, we, even if we have to give them bad news in this, like, guess what, the investigations are going to continue into 2015. As long as we do it on a quarterly basis, it's a tremendous uh, tool with the donors to sustain their confidence in the work. Uh, I've already mentioned this. Um, we had visits of UN officials and representatives throughout the year. It was very, very helpful. Um, the legal counsel, the UN controller in January, I took them uh, to the court. And then um, uh, uh, we took the representatives of the principal donors in June. Uh, and I was just there with Steve Mathias, the Assistant Secretary General for Legal Affairs in August. All of that is extremely helpful back in New York to have that sort of eyes on uh, view of everything. And then finally, we have uh, revised budget requirements for 2015 because of the investigative work uh, undergoing and the demands, particularly in Nick's office, to handle phase two of case two. So we've got to work that through with the donors now. That's the next huge step. Stabilization of funding for the ECCC. Um, we have basically stabilized the funding of the court now. So all of this talk about financial crisis, et cetera, really is a historical statement now. Um, in 2012, the crisis was in the international budget. And all of this was basically, to be quite frank with you, it was simply because Japan pulled out. Um, they had a tsunami in 2011. Uh, and they said, you know, I'm sorry, we're just not going to fund your court anymore. I mean, they, they do still fund, but not in the huge, uh, the large amounts of money that they used to. And so when that Japanese money was pulled from the international budget in 2012, we had a gap of at least six or seven million dollars that had to be filled with new donors. And that created the crisis in the international budget, so that took a lot of work to get through. And then in 2013, and we stabilized it by the end of the year. And then in 2013, uh, the Japanese money that had been allocated for the national budget was pulled. So again, it was the Japanese money withdrawing uh, that created the huge problem we had in the much smaller national budget. And we 
spent a long time insisting with the Cambodian government that they pay it all, and the Cambodian government said, wait a minute, you're changing the, game, the rules of the game for us. We always paid operational costs out of our budget, and then we had foreign donors like Japan paying the salaries, and now you're saying we have to pay the salaries. And we said, yes, under the agreement, you have to pay the salaries. Um, or find foreign donors who will. And so we went through a tough year in 2013, but we finally came out of it, and uh, in the fourth quarter, the, the Cambodian government agreed to pay the fourth quarter salaries at $1.8 million, and then they agreed to pay the first quarter of 2014 salaries at $1.1 million. Um, but, under, uh, but we struck a deal with them that then we would work with them to find foreign donors for the second, third, and fourth quarters, which we have done. Norway has covered the second quarter, Sweden covered the third quarter, and um, we're working on the fourth quarter. I mean, uh, it, you know, it, I'm not too, too concerned at this point. Um, and, um, okay, so then commitment authority was achieved, and, uh, and then the final point that obviously it, it requires a constant process of fundraising, and also dealing with individual government's fiscal years, which are, everyone's got a different fiscal year, so you have to, it's a rolling process fundraising. Uh, you, you never start the year, calendar year, saying, oh, I've got all these pledges in tow. No, the pledges come in depending on fiscal year calendars for each government. I wanted to just show you the major funders historically, since 2006, of the court. Japan is still at top uh, with 40% total on the international budget, 30% on the national. But just remember, Japan is now a, a, a rather minor funder. In fact, I haven't received any money from Japan for 2014 yet, and I'm still working that. Um, uh, so Japan has really, you know, just come down. It's the United States which is now the major funder of the court um, uh, among all the other funders. And then, of course, you see the others, Australia, Germany, uh, Cambodia I put in because of their contribution to the national budget. And then United Kingdom, U European Union, this is a little deceiving because uh, we know the European Union is going to come through for us at the end of this year with a very large amount of money uh, for both national and international budgets. And so we're, we're anticipating that, that tick up uh, at the end of this year. But their decision making process in Brussels does delay it a little bit. France and then Sweden has become a major funder to the extent that it's now on the principal donors group of the court. Uh, and is uh, just a tremendous force behind uh, making the court work and uh, funding it and, and being supportive of it. Norway is also competing with Sweden a little bit, but still hasn't caught up. Um, new funders that we've brought in since 2012 are the Republic of Korea, Denmark, Finland, New Zealand, Austria, Malaysia, Liechtenstein, Qatar, which was the first Arab country to come in, Chile, the first South American country to come in. I put my name there for only one reason, I, not to promote myself at all. I, I'm really honest about this. I just wanted to demonstrate to you that I am always asking, I'm always telling people you, you can be a private donor to this court. And so I, as a fundraiser, I say, I've got to put my, my money where my mouth is. When I show this, the, there's a different list I show people. I mean, this is a PowerPoint. But when they see my name there, the, the foreign ministries, they look up and they say, what, what, what's this? You know, you know, you're, you're a donor? And I said, yes, because private individuals, private foundations can be donors. Do you have any ideas along those lines? And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and so I use it as a marketing device. And um, uh, I, I, well, anyway, so it's been sort of an enjoyable little journey with my name on that list. <laughs> But it's the, it's the only private name on that list. There's no other private donor on that list yet, but it's my goal. Uh, we are potential funders on deck are Kuwait, India, and Indonesia. We're working them extremely hard. Uh, two out of three of those look extremely pro promising. So there you have the totals. Now, the 2014 budget is $23.4 million. You can see how the contributions play out uh, in the budget. Uh, We've got a, a subtotal there of 12.3, of um, but then of course we have lots of pledges. We, we, know we're, we know the money's coming in. It's just what's your cash in the bank versus what your pledges are. Uh, that's the whole, you know, pledge and shortfall 6.8, but you know, we know, we know where that money's coming in. Um, on the national budget, you can see who the donors have been. Uh, 
uh, Malaysia, Norway, Qatar. These contributions from Malaysia, which was the first ASEAN country to contribute in recent years, and then Qatar, the first Arab country, are small, but they broke the ceiling. It was very tough to break those ceilings with those two groups, but now we've broken it and we use it as leverage in our negotiations. Um, and these countries, like Qatar said, we're giving you 20,000 this year, we want you to know we're here for the long term, it'll be more in later years, but this is a beginning. So uh, all of that is encouraging. Um, on the national budget firm pledges, um, you can see what all, all of this is going. The Chilean money will be going to the national budget, uh, et cetera. Okay, and that's it. So thank you very much. You take a couple questions. Yeah, whatever your time permits. Yes. Could you be successful with obtaining funds from private foundations? Uh, no, not yet. And now, there were private foundations which in the very beginning of the court, uh, like Microsoft and stuff, did uh, provide funding. Um, but I have to, I have to, and also in-kind funding like computers and stuff. But I have to tell you that in terms of my time uh, on this project, working with private foundations is actually far more time consuming than working with a government. Because a private foundation has a, a, a degree of grant paperwork um, that is, is substantial. Uh, requires an enormous amount of information about the court being conveyed to that private foundation. Um, and, you know, I've, I sort of find that in terms of the amount of money we need, which is in the millions of dollars, it's actually more worth my time to work with governments than private foundations. But, um, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a nice concept but everyone wants money from private foundations, so it becomes a very, very time-consuming process to sit down and talk with them and, and seek their funding. Yeah, and as a follow-up to that, uh, what about collaboration? Well, you said Microsoft, uh, but... Yeah, I know, and, and it's interesting, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, um, corporations usually will, will direct you to their foundations, you know and then you just get into the whole foundation wrap again. It's not that it's, it's, it's a good idea, it's just a question of my time. The, the foundation route is extremely time consuming to work through. And uh, I have to use, and frankly, you know, there's an interest at the UN that this court, it, that it be demonstrated that governments are supporting this court. Um, and so I tend to prioritize my time time with governments, but um, I always have the, the foundations in mind, and usually the foundations come up uh, when I'm talking with them uh, in, in other contexts, and then I bring this into it. In fact, yes, I can give you an example of a foundation. Actually, I did this this year. It's funny, I don't think of this immediately. Um, a related project to the court, which is the outreach work of the court, uh, and getting the, the information about this court out there is the Cambodia Tribunal Monitor, which we started at my law school back in uh, 2008. And um, that, that is a website that covers everything about the court, um, and it's, it's viewed by tens of thousands uh, of, of, well, thousands of people every month, tens and tens of thousands of, of uh, readers around the world every year. That requires funding. And so I started negotiations with the Robert Bosch Foundation in Germany in uh, the fall. And by April, they had provided the grant money for that website to be in operation through April 2015 at least. So yes, there is foundation support, but it's not directly to the court. It's for projects that are ancillary to it. That's also true, by the way, for the reparations projects. Uh, we go to the foundations for the reparations projects as well as the German ministry and the Swiss development. So uh, the reparations projects are, are very ripe for foundation support and they have received it. That's it? Okay.
David, now that you're on the donor list for the ad hoc tribunals, I know that the residual mechanism for the special court for Sierra Leone is still looking for money. So uh, anyway, okay, uh, we go in from here, we go into the year and review.